let's start with segmenting words into each individual sound or phoneme. Today's words have blends in them, so be really sure to separate each individual sound while we chop the words into sounds. The first word is tray. Tray. A. The next one is dreamy. Dreamy. E. Grin. Grin. G. R. I. N. Free. Free. R. E. Crisp. Crisp. K. R. I. Sleeve. 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 From. From. Mm, great job. Now we will add sounds or phonemes to the beginning of a word to make a new word. So I will say the part, you repeat the part, and then we'll add a sound and make a new word. So let's start with rim. Rim. Add t to the beginning and the word is trim. Raid. Raid. Add g to the beginning and the word is Grade. Right. Right. Add b to the beginning and the word is bright. Loot. Loot. Add f to the beginning and the word is flute. Leap. Leap. Add s to the beginning and the word is sleep. Rice. Rice. Add p to the beginning and the word is price. Great job. Now we're going to add sounds to the end of parts to make a new word. So you repeat the part, say her, her, add t to the end and the word is hurt. Sir, sir, add ch to the end and the word is search. Per, per, add s to the end and the word is purse. Bore, Bore. Add m to the end and the word is born. Shore. Shore. Add t to the end and the word is short. Mark. Mark. Add er to the end and the word is marker. Great job. Now we are going to blend parts together or syllables to make the whole word. I will chop the word into parts and then you are just going to listen and blend all the parts together to say the word. Spaghetti. Spaghetti. Company. Company. Happening. Happening. Grass hop her grasshopper sell a break celebrate ant eater ant eater brock co lee broccoli dynamite dynamite great job now this time, I'm going to say the word. You will repeat the word and you will use your hands to chop the word into syllables. Here's our first example. Potato. Potato. Get your choppers up. Potato. Great job. Kangaroo. 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 Emotion. 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 Tornado. 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 Beautiful. 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 Alphabet. 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 Oxygen. 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 Library. 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 Telephone. Telephone. Tell a phone. Discussion. 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 The last one, Valentine. Valentine. 
Valentine. Great job, everyone. Hi, Arlington community. Mrs. Kaufman here today to work with you on tackling a word, tackling those hard, high frequency words. How am I going to spell them when I get to them in writing? So first, you're going to study the word and try to spell it. So the first word I want to show you that might be tricky is often. I often eat popcorn when I watch a movie. So now I have to figure out the hard part of the word. Often. Ooh, I think there's a part that's hard in the beginning and a part at the end. So now I'm thinking about off and I'm going to try to invent a trick to help me. So off sounds like O-F-F, -F, but I know that there's only one F, so I'm going to cross it out. And then off tin, hmm, but it spelled like the number 10. So I wrote off, cross out an F, and write the number 10. Off tin. Let's try this with another word. Tackling hard words. So now I want to tackle the word before. Before I go to bed, I brush my teeth. So I try to spell it B E F O R E. Ooh, I'm figuring out the hard part. The hard part is the ending. Yeah, because I know the word B, B, and I know the word for, but then there's that E at the end. Ooh, so my tricky help is that I'm going to think about the word store and the word sore. I like to go to the store and my back is sore from gardening. So before has an E at the end too. So now I give you one last word and think about what's the hard part in slowly and what trick could you invent to learn that word and tackle it? Today in phonics, we're going to talk about our controlled vowels. An R controlled syllable, or bossy R, is a vowel or a pair of vowels that's followed by the letter R. The R slightly changes the sound of the vowel so that it sounds neither short nor long. Let me introduce you to the three ers. Each of these patterns have the same sound, er. Listen to this sentence. What sound do you hear that's the same in each word? Pert Bertha nervously whispered her tender verse. Did you hear the er sound in each of those words? You're right. The spelling er is the most frequently used of the three ers. It should be your first choice when you're making an educated guess about how to spell a word with an er. We use the pattern er like in the word fern. Let's read some other words that use the pattern er to make the er sound. Fern, finger, herd, winter, verb. Listen to this sentence. What sound do you hear that's the same in each of the words? Shirley's birds chirp first. Did you hear the er sound again in each of those words? You're right. This is the second most commonly used of the three er sounds. The ir, as in bird, has a dotted i. Just like a bird has a dotted i too. Let's practice reading some words that use the pattern IR. Third, dirt, bird, shirt, birthday. All right, listen up. One more sentence. What sound do you hear that's the same in each of these words? I bet you already probably have a guess. Burl furnished surplus church furniture. Did you hear the er sound again in each of those words? You're right. 
We never want something to burn. So you are, like in burn, is the least commonly used of the three ers. It should be our last choice when making an educated guess about how an er word is spelled. Let's practice reading some words that use the pattern you are to make the er sound. Hurt, burn, curl, curb, fur. You can think about the triplets to help you remember the three ers. E-R, like in Bertha, I-R, like in Shirley, and you are like in Kurt. Be on the lookout for these bossy R words when you're reading and think about them whenever you're writing. Today's nonfiction selection is Guardian Dogs, Penguin Protectors. Before we begin to read Guardian Dogs, Penguin Protectors, there are a few words we need to know to help us understand the meaning of the text. The first word is breed. Breed means to produce offspring or babies. In the picture, we see the offspring of the little penguins who will be in our story today. Breed also can mean a group of animals who have common ancestors and similar characteristics. In the picture, you can see different breeds of dogs. The next word is burrow. A burrow is an underground home that is dug by an animal. You can see the little penguins and their burrow in the picture. We'll also need to know what a conservationist is. Conservationists are people who work to protect plants, animals, and natural resources in our environment. Finally, we'll need to know what a predator is. Predators are animals that hunt and eat other animals. Let's take a look at guardian dogs, penguin protectors. Guardian Dogs, Penguin Protectors, written by Gabrielle Fimre. Here's the table of contents. There are several sections to this text. Today, we will be reading the first three sections, Penguin Protectors, Little Penguins, A Brilliant Idea. Penguin Protectors. Yudi and Tula are on patrol. They protect the little penguins of Middle Island off the coast of Australia. These shaggy white marema dogs watch over the penguins that come to the island every year to breed. The smell of the dogs and their booming bark keep the penguins safe from red foxes. These foxes nearly cause the little penguins to vanish from this small rocky island. Here we see a map of Australia and we can see where Middle Island is related to the rest of the continent. Middle Island covers less than five acres. That's about the size of five and a half American football fields without the end zones. Little penguins come ashore each night during breeding season in Australia. Little penguins. The little penguin, the smallest in the world, stands only 30 centimeters, 12 inches tall. It lives all across New Zealand and Southern Australia. It is sometimes called the little blue penguin or the fairy penguin. During breeding season, little penguins live in burrows dug in sand. Once they lay eggs, they get ready for them to hatch. After the eggs hatch, adults fish during the day and return to their burrows at dusk to feed the babies. The chicks are ready to leave the nest when they are about eight weeks old. For years, little penguins raised families on Middle Island close to the city of Warrnambool. Australia. Then in the 1900s, the 1990s, foxes began to appear on the island. During the summer, the tide is very low. Foxes can walk to the island from the mainland. As the number of foxes grew, they began to eat the little penguins. By 2005, the penguin population on Middle Island was nearly wiped out by fox attacks. That year, only four penguins were spotted, says Christy King. 
she keeps track of the penguins on the island. It seemed that the days of the little penguin on Middle Island might be over forever. A brilliant idea. One local chicken farmer had a brilliant idea. Alan Swampy Marsh suggested using maremmas to protect the penguins. He used the dogs to protect his chickens. So why couldn't they protect penguins? Maremmas have been bred in Italy for hundreds of years. They protect farm animals, usually chickens or sheep, from predators such as wolves and foxes. Yudi and Tula know they are on patrol when they are on the boardwalk. Maremma, sheepdogs or guardian dogs? The Maremma sheepdog breed originally comes from Italy. It is bred to guard livestock. In Australia, this same breed of dog also protects other animals. The Middle Island Maremma Project calls these dogs guardian dogs because they don't guard sheep. Neighbors and conservationists came together to give the idea a try. The Warren Ball City Council and Warren Ball Coast Care Land Care Group created the Middle Island Maremma Project. To see if Marsh's idea would work, one of his dogs was brought to the island for a few weeks. These hero dogs turned out to be the perfect answer. Since coming to the island in 2006, there have been no known attacks on penguins by red foxes. This has allowed the number of penguins on the island to increase, King says. As of 2013-2014 breeding season, almost 200 penguin, penguins had returned to the island. Vince Harborfield, deputy leader of the Warmville Coast Care Land Care Group, assists in keeping track of the penguins. We'll be using what we just read in Guardian Dogs, Penguin Protectors, to talk about the reading strategy of main idea and supporting details. The main idea is what the author wants you to understand about the text. Some strategies to help you determine the main idea are, ask yourself, what is the text mostly about? Look at the title or headings. Look at the pictures. Pay attention to the first and last sentences of a section of text. Look for repeated words, phrases, or ideas. Supporting details describe or support the main idea. Supporting details can be examples, facts, steps, definitions, descriptions, reasons, or comparisons. Think of the main idea as the tabletop and the supporting details as the table legs. This image can help us remember what we mean when we talk about main idea and supporting details. Let's give it a try with Guardian Dogs Penguin Protectors. The main idea of this story is Maremmas, dogs who are bred to guard livestock, were taught to protect little penguins from danger. The supporting details come from all the pages of text that we read. One supporting idea, one supporting detail for this main idea is little penguins who breed on Middle Island were being killed at a high rate by red foxes who began to appear on the island. A second supporting detail is, a farmer who used maremmas to protect his chickens from predators suggested using the dogs to protect the little penguins. A third supporting detail for our main idea is, neighbors and conservationists came together to try the idea which worked the dogs were able to protect the little penguins. Thinking about the main idea and supporting details helps us understand what the text is mostly about. I hope you enjoyed reading Guardian Dogs, Penguin Protectors. You can find this text on Raz Kids and finish the rest of the chapters on your own. I'm happy to be back with you today to do some nonfiction writing. I have my teeny tiny notepad and I have been writing down the moments in my life that are different than the ordinary things, the things that make me think and make me feel. Have you been noticing those times in your life? Well, today I'm going to be taking an idea about something that happened to me from my teeny tiny notebook and 
writing my story. Remember, first you think of an idea, something that's happened to you. Then you plan your writing. You think of first what happened at the beginning, then what happened, then what happened next, and then, and then at the end, what happened. There could be more than one middle section. And then you write. You write your pictures. You write your words. I'm going to choose a time from my teeny tiny notebook. Right here, the time a mouse was in my house. And I'm going to plan my story. First, I was sitting at the table with my husband and he looked across the room and noticed there was a mouse in our house. And then we figured out how we were gonna catch it. And last, we caught it and we released it outside. Another thing that might help me remember my story would be to jot down some words that might help me remember what happened. First, there was a mouse in my house. So I'm just gonna write this right into my sloppy copy illustration area. Mouse in house. And that might help me think of the beginning. Now is the time for me to write my words and draw my illustration. I said, my husband, who we call Mr. B, Mr. B is right here. Here he is. I'm just going to draw a quick sketch. Pointed. You can add more details later. Pointed this direction across the room. What did I say? Mr. B looked over and saw something across the room, something on the floor. So I'm just going to write that. Mr. B, remember you need finger spaces. Mr. B, and names start with capital letters. Mr. B looked over. and saw something, he saw something moving, and saw something moving across the room. How do I stop my voice? Period, that's right. Mr. B looked over and saw something moving across the room. Oh no, he said. Now he's talking, so I'm gonna add those quotation marks so we know he's talking. Oh no, he said. How do I stop my voice? Period, that's right. We had been playing a game when all of a sudden he stood up and he said, oh no. So what do you think I said? What's wrong, right? So that was me talking. What's, what is comes together and makes what's, what's wrong? I asked. I think I saw a mouse in our house, he said. So again, he's talking, let's put those quotation marks. I think, I, I'll say just, just saw a mouse in our house. Now I think he said it with a little more expression because he was surprised and we were not happy to have a mouse. So I think we need an exclamation point. I think he said it more like, I think I just saw a mouse in our house, he said. I'm going to put a period there. Now, good writers always reread, so help me. Mr. B looked over 
and saw something moving across the room. Oh no, he said. Let's put an exclamation point there too. What's wrong? I asked. I think I just saw a mouse in our house, he said. Now I'm gonna go back and add more to my illustration later. Next is the middle of my story. I'm going to go ahead and divide this section into two parts because the next thing that happened, I saw the mouse myself. First, I saw it running across the floor and I'm going to go ahead and just sketch really quickly, the best I can, running across the floor. And then I saw it run and hide in the corner of the room by a window. hoping it would not be seen by us. So that's what I'm gonna write. Then I saw the mouse myself, right? So I'm gonna write that sentence to start with capital letters. Then, that's my connecting word for my middle of my story. Then I saw the mouse too, right? Mr. B had already seen it. I saw the mouse I think I'd say, then I saw the mouse. I'm gonna put an exclamation point because I was shocked, right? First, I saw it run across the room. First, there it is. I saw it run, I'll say in the middle of the room, in the middle of, what room are we in? The living room. The living room. And then I saw it hide in the corner by the window. How do I stop my voice? You're right, period. How are we gonna catch it and put it outside? We were thinking, right? And I think uh, I might have asked that because I was the most nervous about having a mouse. So there's my quotation marks again, and I'm asking Mr. B, how are we going to catch it, I asked. How are we, we had a problem. How are we going to catch it? Question mark. I asked a question, right? Stop talking. How are we going to ask it? I asked Mr. B. Mr. B is a name, capital letter, Mr. B. Well, he had a plan. He said that we could get some boxes and we could try and capture it into one of those boxes. And then we go to the end of our story. So finally, we captured the mouse in a box and we tossed him outside into the grass. So we caught the mouse in a box and tossed him outside into the grass and tossed it I don't know if it was a he or a she, tossed it outside into the grass. How do I stop my voice? Period. So I could draw some grass here and I could show him being tossed outside into the grass. Now, it's your turn to write. Hi, second and third graders. It's Miss Hutchison. I was in the kitchen this morning baking some cookies and my recipe called for one third a cup of sugar and three fourths a cup of flour. And I started thinking to myself, is that more sugar or more flour? I got out my measuring cups and here's my one third cup. So that's how much sugar I needed. 
And I don't have a three-fourths cup, so I used my one-fourths cup three times. And it turned out the three-fourths of a cup was bigger than one-third. But I was thinking to myself, how do you compare fractions? So we're going to work on that together today. For our number sense routine today, we are going to play a game called Would You Rather. To play Would You Rather, you just have to choose which of two things you would rather have or do. But you need to explain your thinking. Here's our situation for today. You and a friend are sharing a snack equally. Would you rather share plate A or plate B? Here are your choices. You and a friend are going to share the snack equally. You can either share plate A or plate B. You and your friend have to share so that you each get an equal amount. Which plate would you rather have? If you would rather share plate A, what is your reason? One reason I thought of for preferring plate A would be that you could have one piece, your friend could have another piece, and you could split the last piece in half. That way, you and your friend could each have one and a half pieces of watermelon. That might be easier than sharing the big piece because you could each have one whole piece and only have to split one of the small pieces. If you would rather share plate B, what is your reason? One reason I thought of is that you would have to split the piece of watermelon and then you and your friend could each have a big piece. There's no right answer for this would you rather. And to know for sure which plate has more watermelon, we would have to measure. But as long as you can explain your thinking, you're thinking like a mathematician. For our mini lesson today, we are going to look at fractions or parts of a whole. By the end of the lesson, you will be able to compare fractions using words and symbols. We will use words like these. Is greater than, is less than, is equal to. And we will also use symbols like these, is greater than, is less than, is equal to. Let's start with these fractions. Two sixths and eight twelfths. Which fraction do you think is bigger? If I look at the numbers, I can see that two sixths means I have two pieces out of six equal pieces in the whole. Eight twelfths means I have eight pieces out of 12 equal pieces in the whole. My numerators are not the same and my denominators are not the same. That means I have a different number of pieces, two pieces compared to eight pieces, and the size of the pieces is different. There's six equal pieces in the whole compared to 12 equal pieces in the whole. When the number of pieces and the size of the pieces are different, it can be hard to tell which fraction is bigger, but, this problem gives us pictures, and we can use the pictures to help us figure out which fraction is bigger. Let's ignore the numbers for now 
and just look at the picture. The holes are the same size. This whole circle is the same size as this whole circle. That means I can look at the part that's colored in and compare the fraction. Is this fraction bigger or is this fraction bigger? I can see that more of the fraction is colored in in the blue circle. So that means that fraction is bigger. Let's use words and symbols to explain. I'll point the opening of my symbol towards the bigger fraction. You might have learned the trick that you can imagine that it's a hungry mouth eating the bigger amount. Or you might have learned the trick that this side of the symbol is bigger than this side of the symbol. This symbol is called is less than, so we can read our expression 2 sixths is less than 8 twelfths. Let's try another. I'm comparing 2 thirds and 4 sixths. I'll look at the pictures instead of the numbers. What do you think? Which picture looks bigger? To me, the pictures look almost the same. There are some strategies we can use to try and figure out whether they're exactly the same or not. One strategy is turning the shape in your mind so that the shaded part is facing the same direction. If I imagine turning the yellow shape so that the shaded part is up, it looks just like the blue shape. I think they're equal. Another strategy is trying to make the equal parts the same size. I notice that some of the lines splitting up these shapes are the same. This line matches here, this line matches here, and this line matches here. But the blue fraction has more lines. Let's draw those lines onto the yellow fraction. I can put a line here, a line here, and a line here. Now, my pieces look like the same size, so I can count the pieces to compare them. The yellow fraction has one, two, three, four equal pieces, and the blue fraction has one, two, three, four equal pieces. They're the same. Let's use symbols and words to compare the fractions. Which symbol do you think you should put between the fractions? You're right. The fractions are equal, so we should put the equal sign. We can read this expression, 2 thirds is equal to 4 sixths. Take a look at these fractions. Which one do you think is bigger? Which symbol and what words would you use to compare the fractions? Since these fractions are already pointing the same direction, they're pretty easy to compare. I can see that the yellow fraction takes up about this much of the pink fraction and then the pink fraction has extra, which means it's bigger. This is another fraction where I can use the strategy of making the pieces equal. If I split each of these sections, now my orange fraction looks the same as my pink fraction, and I have only four equal pieces compared to one, two, three, four, five, six equal pieces, so I still think the pink fraction is bigger. What words and symbols would you use? We can say two-fifths is less than six-tenths.
Try comparing these fractions on your own. The answer is 3 fifths is greater than 1 half. Try one more. Remember, in your mind, you can turn the fractions so that the parts that are colored in are facing the same direction. The answer is 1 fourth is less than 3 eighths. Today, we practiced comparing fractions using words and symbols. Remember to always look at the picture to help you see which fraction is bigger. Let's reflect on our learning today. I'm going to show you two more fractions that you might see in real life. Which fraction of pizza do you think is bigger? This was a trick question. We can't really compare these fractions of pizza. Why not? What makes it so that we cannot compare these fractions? We can't compare these fractions because the whole is not the same size. Here's what the whole pizzas might look like if pieces weren't taken out. The pizza on the right is bigger than the pizza on the left. So we cannot compare the fractions. Think back to our watermelon from our would you rather activity. With the watermelon, the whole is also the same size. We can't say A is smaller just because the pieces are smaller because there are more of them. And we can't say B is bigger just because the piece is bigger because there's only one piece. So remember, when you're comparing fractions, the whole has to be the same size. Now it's time for our family math tip. Hi, parents and families. I hope you enjoyed comparing fractions with your student today. You may have heard the expression, a picture is worth a thousand words. Well, in math, this is especially true. When you're doing math with your student, use visuals. They always help children understand what is happening. This is true for fractions, for story problems, for just about any type of math. When a problem doesn't give a picture, try sketching one. It doesn't have to look beautiful. A math picture can be a quick and easy way to help understand what's going on in a problem. So when in doubt, draw a picture. Have fun. Hi, my name is Erin San. I am a teacher and a mindfulness coach. And what that means is I work with people just like you to help them use all of their senses to notice what's happening in their lives from moment to moment without any judgment so they can stress less and smile a whole lot more. Today, I am going to share with you an exercise that you can use anytime you feel frustrated or upset because you think you've made a mistake. I want to also share with you that mistakes happen all the time. We all make mistakes. Humans, everybody, everywhere make mistakes. And it's okay to make a mistake. Sometimes that's how we learn. This exercise is a way to be really nice and kind and patient with yourself when you notice, notice that you've made a mistake and start to feel kind of icky about it. Are you ready to practice?
Great. We're gonna begin by coming into a comfortable seated position. Remember, sometimes we need to move and shake our body just a little bit in order for us to then settle into a place of comfort and stillness. So when you're ready, let your body become comfortable. And let your body relax into stillness. And if you'd like to close your eyes, close your eyes. And if you'd like to keep them open, let them stare at one spot that's not moving so your mind can start to settle a little bit. Start to notice where you feel icky in your body. When you notice that you've made a mistake, does it start to hurt in your neck? Maybe you feel it in your chest. Maybe it changes your breathing. Maybe it makes you feel sick to your stomach. Or maybe your legs and your hips start to feel really tight. Begin to take five deep breaths, sending those breaths right into the body where your body needs it. Each breath is filled with love, with kindness. Each breath helps to make your body feel a little bit more comfortable. And then bring your hand over your heart. This next exercise is one of self-compassion. Self-compassion means being kind and loving and patient with yourself, just as you would be for a friend who's having a bad day or a friend who fell down on the playground and hurt her knee. You might go over, put your hand around them and say, everything's going to be okay. I'm here for you. And that is self-compassion saying to yourself, everything is going to be okay. I am here for myself. So with your hand over your heart, say to yourself, I am okay. It is okay to make mistakes. I will learn from my mistakes. and I will always be kind to myself. You can repeat those sentences as many times as you want to or need to, to help yourself feel better. Thank you so much for practicing with us today. I look forward to seeing you again soon. Second Step Lessons are created by Committee for Children, who owns and controls all rights therein. Permission was granted to District to make and broadcast this video for educational use only by District parents, families, teachers, and counselors with students currently learning via television broadcast due to the impact of COVID-19. No other use of this video or Second Step Lessons is permitted. Committee for Children, 2020. Hi everyone, Miss Davis here. I'm glad you're back and I hope you're staying safe and healthy. Guess what? You made it halfway through summer school. Good job. This week we're going to be talking about strong feelings and how to calm down. Today we're going to talk about mistakes. Making a mistake can make us feel upset, sad, 
or even embarrassed. It may even make us feel like we want to give up. If you need some encouragement and you like music, you should check out the song Don't Give Up by Bruno Mars and Sesame Street. Ask an adult to help you find it on YouTube after the lesson. Don't give up. Oh, I love that song. Each Muppet that was making a mistake didn't give up. If they had just decided, this is too hard. I'll never catch the ball. I'll never be able to roller skate. They would never have that feeling of having done something hard, having practiced something and actually achieved a new goal. Keep that in mind as things get hard. Don't give up. And know that making mistakes is how we know what we need to practice more. So let's keep that in mind as we talk about how to handle making mistakes. Take a look at this picture. This is Ken. Ken just got his paragraph writing assignment back and it's full of spelling mistakes again. Think about how Ken's body feels. Look at his hand, his mouth, his eyes, his head. He's feeling really uncomfortable. His face is hot, his cheeks are red. He feels really tense. He's mad. He notices that his heart is racing beating very fast, his stomach doesn't feel good, and he's hot. He's uncomfortable. When you make mistakes, your body may feel uncomfortable. Strong feelings make it hard to think and know what to do. What Ken wants to do is he wants to crumple up his paper and throw it away. Think about why crumpling up the paper and throwing it away are not good ideas. Well, you might be thinking his teacher might think it's disrespectful to crumple up his paper and throw it away. Also, if he crumples up his paper, he won't know what words he needs to practice spelling. Everyone makes mistakes. Mistakes are an important part of learning that show us what we need to practice. Sometimes making mistakes can feel very frustrating and embarrassing, and that makes it hard to think and learn. So Ken needs to manage this strong feeling he's having. Let's see, what could Ken do to calm down his strong feeling. Last week we talked about using self-talk. Maybe he could say, relax, I'm feeling frustrated, I'm upset. As Ken says that to himself, he actually starts to calm down, but his body still feels pretty uncomfortable, so he needs to calm down completely. He decides to use belly breathing. Let's watch a video that will teach you all about belly breathing. Hi, I'm Brent. You know, just like you, I sometimes get mad, frustrated, or excited. And when that happens to me, I use belly breathing to help me calm down. This is how I do it. I put my hands on my belly. I pay attention to my breathing. I take a breath that makes my belly move out when I breathe in. And back in when I breathe out. I breathe in slowly through my nose. And out through my mouth. It's like smelling some delicious hot soup. And then blowing on it to cool it down. 
My breathing is so quiet that I can hardly hear it. What do you think? Want to test it out? Try it with me. Put your hands on your belly. Take a breath that makes your belly move out when you breathe in through your nose. And back in when you breathe out through your mouth. Breathe in slowly through your nose and out through your mouth. Raise your hand if you can feel your belly moving in and out. Nicely done. Let's practice again. It's easy to learn and it will really help you out. Next time you get upset or too excited to think, try it out. After using belly breathing to calm down, Ken can think about what to do. He decides to be assertive and ask for help. Being assertive means asking for what we need. He raises his hand and asks his teacher for help with his writing assignment. Maybe you've made mistakes like Ken before. Maybe you've accidentally hit a friend in the face with a ball. Maybe you gave the wrong answer for a math question. Maybe you've taken home the wrong backpack because it looked just like yours. When you feel strong feelings about making mistakes, it's important to calm down so you can think, learn, and ask for help when you need it. There's a fun book about mistakes called It's Okay to Make Mistakes by Todd Parr. You can find a read aloud on YouTube after the lesson. See you soon. Hola chicos. Mi nombre es Diana Silva y soy una maestra en la Escuela de Inmersión Claremont. Estoy muy emocionada de estar con ustedes nuevamente para nuestra lección en casa con APS. La lección de hoy es sobre fracciones. ¡Vamos! Exploremos las fracciones juntos. Fracciones. Vamos a comenzar la lección de hoy con la rutina numérica a continuación. Mira la imagen. ¿Qué notaste? ¿En qué se parecen? Te voy a dar unos segundos para pensar. Voy a usar la oración a continuación para responder a la rutina numérica. Las imágenes son similares en que las dos imágenes tienen un total de 54 rombos. Para mí, la primera imagen representa a un entero. La segunda imagen es el entero que está el primero, pero esta vez está dividido en seis partes iguales. Un sexto, dos sextos, tres sextos, cuatro sextos, cinco sextos y seis sextos. Recuerda, si tú tenías una respuesta diferente, tu respuesta también está correcta, siempre y cuando puedas explicar tu pensamiento. Objetivo de aprendizaje Al final de la lección, tú podrás representar fracciones propias en una recta numérica. Fracciones. Una fracción muestra partes iguales de un entero. 
En el ejemplo tenemos un medio. El número de arriba de la fracción, el 1, es el numerador y representa las partes que tienes. El número de abajo, el 2, es el denominador y representa el entero o el total de partes que tiene el entero. Como dijimos, que tú vas a poder representar fracciones propias en la recta numérica, repasemos que es una fracción propia. Una fracción propia, el numerador, que es el número de arriba, es menor que el denominador. Por lo tanto, la fracción es menor que la unidad o que el entero. En el ejemplo, vemos que 6, el numerador, el número de arriba, es menor que 8, el denominador. Eso quiere decir que es menos de un entero. Vamos a repasar. Numerador, mira hacia arriba. Apunta hacia arriba. Numerador, arriba. Denominador, mira hacia abajo. Apunta hacia abajo. Numerador, denominador. Vamos a repasar vocabulario esencial para esta lección. Primero tenemos un entero. Voy a dividir mi entero en dos partes iguales y ahora tengo un medio. Voy a dividir el entero en tres partes partes iguales y ahora tengo un tercio. Ahora estamos dividiendo el entero en cuatro partes iguales y tengo un cuarto. Si divido el entero en seis partes iguales tengo un sexto y si divido el entero en ocho partes iguales tengo un octavo. Hoy comí pizza para mi almuerzo. Corté mi pizza en mitad. Hay dos partes iguales. Una mitad y otra mitad. Dos partes iguales. Ahora voy a dibujar una recta numérica y quiero encontrar un medio o una mitad. Primero debo de empezar por colocar un cero al principio de mi recta numérica. Después, al final voy a poner uno que representa el entero. Dividí o corté mi pizza en dos partes iguales. Esto quiere decir que voy a cortar mi recta numérica en dos partes iguales. Vamos a ver. Vamos a contar los espacios. Un espacio, dos espacios, dos partes iguales. Eso quiere decir que la mitad... Está aquí, un medio. ¿Qué número iría aquí en el entero? Muy bien, dos medios. Si como dos medios, un medio más un medio, voy a comerme toda la pizza y sería un entero. 
Quiero compartir mi galleta de chocolate con tres amigas. Corté mi galleta de chocolate en cuatro partes iguales. Cuartos. Y hay cuatro partes. Una parte para mí y las otras tres para mis amigas. Un cuarto, dos cuarto, cuenta conmigo, tres cuartos, cuatro cuartos o un entero. Ahora quiero representar mi dibujo de fracción en la recta numérica. Paso 1. Dibujar una recta numérica. Paso 2. Empezar por el 0. Y después poner el entero, el 1, al final. ¿En cuántas partes iguales debo dividir mi recta numérica para obtener cuartos? Excelente. En cuatro partes iguales. Un cuarto, dos cuartos, tres cuartos y el entero es cuatro cuartos. Contemos los espacios. Uno, dos, tres. Cuatro. Excelente. Cortamos la recta numérica en cuatro partes iguales. Ahora vamos a escribir nuestra fracción. Un cuarto. Dos cuartos. Tres cuartos. Y el entero es igual a cuatro cuartos. Excelente. Yo me comí un cuarto de la galleta. Un cuarto está aquí. Tengo una barra de granola y las voy a cortar en ocho partes iguales. Tengo tres y ahora voy a aportar en mitad cada tres y tengo seis partes iguales. Seis partes iguales es igual a sextos. Cuenta conmigo, tenemos seis partes iguales. Un sexto, dos. Sextos, tres, sextos, cuatro, sextos, cinco, sextos y seis, sextos es igual a, ayúdame, fantástico, un entero. Ahora vamos a representar la fracción dibujando una recta numérica. Voy a dibujar mi recta numérica y el paso 1 es empezar por el 0 y el entero al final, 1. Hay 6 partes iguales. Eso quiere decir que voy a dividir mi recta numérica en cuántas partes. Excelente, en seis partes iguales. Para obtener seis partes iguales, tengo que dibujar cinco líneas verticales. Uno, dos, tres, cuatro, cinco. Vamos a ver si tengo seis partes iguales. 
Uno, acuérdate que estamos contando no las líneas, pero los espacios. Dos, tres, cuatro, cinco, seis. Muy bien. Quiero comer solamente dos pedazos de mi granola. Vamos a encontrar dos sexto lo que me comí. Empecemos por un sexto, dos sextos, tres sextos, cuatro sextos, cinco sextos y el entero. Si me como seis pedazos de seis, me comí el entero. Seis sextos. Dos sextos se encuentra aquí. Es hora de reflexionar en lo que hemos aprendido en la lección de hoy. Fracciones. Veo. Pienso. Me pregunto. Mira cuidadosamente la foto, comparte con un miembro de tu familia lo que ves, piensas y te preguntas. Consejo familiar de matemáticas. Espero que hayas disfrutado de la lección de hoy. El tip familiar de esta semana es cómo crear tus propias fracciones en casa. Una de las unidades más desafiantes para los alumnos de tercer grado es comparar fracciones con diferentes denominadores. Hoy voy a enseñarte cómo crear tu fracción utilizando papel y después vas a poder comparar. Por ejemplo, aquí tengo dos franjas de papel. La primer franja de papel Voy a doblar en dos partes iguales para crear mi fracción. Si doblé en dos partes iguales, eso quiere decir que tengo mitades. Y puedes escribir tu fracción. Después voy a tomar la siguiente franja de papel, siguiente rectángulo, y quiero compartir mi fracción en tres partes iguales. Quiero crear tercios. Y doble en tres partes iguales. Escribe tu fracción adentro como yo lo hice y ahora tengo tercios. Imagínate que estos son dos chocolates. ¿Tú prefieres comerte una mitad? Y puedo doblar de nuevo y mostrar. Este es el tamaño de la mitad. O un tercio. Y puedes comparar de esta manera. ¿Prefieres comer una mitad o un tercio? ¿Cuál fracción es más grande? ¿Cuál es mayor? ¿Qué pasa si doblo mi fracción en vez de mitad en cuatro partes iguales? ¿Qué pasa con el denominador, que es el número de abajo? ¿En cuántas partes iguales está dividida mi fracción? ¿Qué pasa cuando el denominador se hace más grande? ¿La fracción se hace más grande o más pequeña? ¿Qué piensas? Esta es una manera que puedes practicar comparando fracciones en casa. Espero que esto sea útil para ustedes.